name's Kevin Hines, and this is my story. In this great state, I was born to a woman named Marcia Silvera and a man named Martino Perales. Both battled manic depression, what we today call bipolar disorder, the same brain disease I would later develop. Due to those situations, they turned to drugs, hardcore drugs and alcohol. As a matter of fact, I was born premature because of those drugs. And Marcia and Martino, well, they would leave Jordash and I unattended to go score drugs at seedy motel rooms with concrete floors, the kind of place that was paid for by the hour. A seedy motel clerk made about his most unseedy decision. He heard us scream and cry one too many times for his liking, and he called the police. So those police officers, those two police officers, they barreled down the door, and they took us into protective custody. And they brought us to the foster care system. One day, my fate changed. You see, the reason my name is no longer Giovanni Gabriel Prasad Perales, and it is now John Kevin Hines, because of two beautiful human beings, Patrick Hines and Deborah Hines. And on March 17, 1986, they adopted me and made me their son. They changed my name. They made me their son. My ground was solid. My feet were rooted in. And then, like a Mack truck barreling down the road at 75 miles an hour, it hit me. The first symptom, extreme paranoia. Where the hell did that come from? Extreme paranoia. And after the paranoid delusions would come the manic behavior. Mania. The high of bipolar disorder. Mania, depression. Well, I had bipolar disorder type 1 with psychotic features. A very severe form, actually. So 1998, diagnosed with bipolar disorder. 1999, 2000, pretending to be going to treatment. Oh, I was going to see the doctor. I lied to him too. And I'd go home and my mom and dad, oh yeah, I talked to the doctor. He recommended these, this, this routine with living with mental illness. I got it covered, dad, I'm on it, I'm on it, you know. My mom and dad had been divorced. They had no clue the depth of what I was going through because I hid it from them because I was in denial. I don't have a mental illness. I played football, for God's sake. I was a champion wrestler. September 24th of the year 2000. Trying to figure out what was going on in my brain, I, I, I looked online for ways to end my life. And I found them. And they told me, I live in San Francisco, go to the Golden Gate Bridge, jump off, you will die upon impact, good luck, exclamation point, with the click of a few buttons. I got on the next bus, I sat in the very last seat in the middle row, we began to drive out to the Golden Gate Bridge. And that's when it hit me. The ambivalence. I realized I didn't want to die at all. I realized that I thought, I said, well, what are you doing, Kevin? Get off the bus. But then because of my illness and because of my brain's misaligned chemicals, I began to hear the voices but these voices were loud and clear. 
And on that bus, they were screaming in my head, you must die. You must die. Jump now. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm crying my eyes out, hoping for one individual on this bus crowded with people to look at me and say, hey, kid, are you okay? Hey, kid, is something wrong? Can I help you to reach out, to touch me, to, to see my pain? Everyone was in their own little world. Now, it's not their responsibility to take care of me. It's not their personal interest to see if I'm okay. But I say to you now, the next time you see someone in obvious emotional distress, suffering, and pain, and you don't know them from Adam, I beg of you to walk up to that person. Look them in the eyes. Do not turn away and say something to the effect of, are you okay? Is something wrong? Or can I help you? You could quite literally save a life in that moment. I, I was walking up to the bus driver hoping that he would see my pain. But I could not say it overtly. I could not tell him that I was in trouble. I could not make those sounds. And he looked at me. And in typical San Francisco Muni fashion, he said, come on, kid, get off the bus. i got to go. It's his job. He's got to go to the rest of his route. I understood that. I was sad. A wave of emotion overcame me as I stepped down off of this bus. My feet heavy. My heart palpitating. Waterfalls flowing out of my eyes. My eyes red. I walked forward. I thought, that's it. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Come on. Everybody cared. Every one of my family members cared. Every single member of my friends cared. People I barely knew that were acquaintances would have cared. My brain wasn't allowing me to care. That irrational thought when dealing with someone who is contemplating suicide. I didn't want to die. I believed I had to. I walked back toward the traffic. I ran as fast as I could. And I threw myself over the rail. I was not, I was not standing on any ledge to be talked back. I was in free fall. And this is the important part. The very millisecond my hands and feet left that rail. The very, very moment I was in free fall. The only thoughts in my mind were, what have I just done? I don't want to die. God, please save me. I hit the water. It's a four second fall. A vacuum opened up and sucked me beneath the water about 70 to 80 feet. But then I opened my eyes. And now I'm drowning? I don't want to drown. That wasn't in my plan. And I really thought, well, why'd you jump in a giant body of water? I frantically moved in any direction. My legs were completely immobile. I had shattered my T12, L1, and L2 lower vertebrae into shards like glass. They splintered all throughout my lower body. My legs are mobile, only using my arms. I was going down. My ears were ringing. My eyes were bulging out of my head. I realized I was going down. I shot for what I thought was the surface. As fast as my arms would take me, and I saw the lit water above me, I could see my destination, and I thought, well, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. You're going to drown. I don't want to drown. God, please save me. I don't want to drown. God, please save me. I don't want to drown. I made a mistake. The greatest mistake of my life. I broke the surface. Barely made it. I bobbed up and down on the water. I swallowed some salt water and I prayed, God, please save me. I don't want to drown. I made a mistake. 
over and over and over again. The voices were gone. The deep, dark depression that brought me to that day had disappeared. The only thing I wanted to do, needed to do, had to do, was survive. In the hospital, they restructured my back with metal. I walked again, as you can clearly see. In the hospital, I had to go from that point to a psychiatric unit. I went from sitting up hours of a day, then into a wheelchair, then to being able to move that wheelchair myself, then being using a walker, and then a cane and a back brace in a matter of weeks. Those doctors saved me. They saved my future. And I have learned today, I have learned very clearly that suicide is never nor should ever be the answer. And I can tell you that I will never attempt to take my own life again. I think about it often enough. I contemplate it all too often. It's part of my life. I have chronic thoughts of suicide. But I will not let them break me. Because I know the wake of destruction, it causes all of those in my path. I lived, and my family is still in pain from what I did. This life, no matter how you live it, no matter what you've gone through, no matter what pains you or ails you, is the single most powerful and amazing gift we have ever been given or will ever be given. Like I said before, I will never take that for granted again. You see, when I look at a glass, much like Debbie Hines, my cup isn't half full or half empty. Today it is overflowing. It is overflowing and exuding with positivity. This gift we've been given is not to be squandered. It's not to be left to the dust. It's not to be left to the devices of a psychotic brain. If you are struggling today, don't wait till tomorrow to get help. Get it now.